Okay, so I'm hoping everyone had a good weekend. Uh, and we're all coming energized to the rest of the semester. Uh, so I want to wait a minute before I start. So any questions so far before we start? Yes, so I'll, I'll get to talk a little bit uh, in a second about the project. So let's keep this question. Uh, okay, so let's start. So, so, so again, I want to remind you to consult the lecture notes all the time, and specifically before uh, lectures because everything is there. Uh, homework. So we have a homework out due next week. Uh, there's one problem that you can still not solve, but you'll be able to solve after this uh, lecture. Uh, even though we believe that this uh, homework is less time consuming than the previous two, if you haven't started working on it, please do, because it could still take you a long time. Um, one important comment uh, is that uh, in homework one and homework two, there were a few cases that uh, we are pretty sure were uh, cases of cheating. Uh, a few of you, a very small number, but still uh, non-zero, uh, either copied from each other or did everything together and basically submitted the same uh, solutions, identical solutions. So. Uh, while I'm still uh, deciding exactly how to deal with it, if you think it's you uh, and you have any good reasons or justification for what has happened, please drop me an email uh, and let me know. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, drop you an email uh, and, and see... Um, what to do with it. Um, okay, uh, recording, yes, we're recording. So let me move to uh, projects. So as we said last week, um, and I sent you over the weekend uh, a pretty detailed description of the projects. We're gonna have three projects. We entertained two others that were proposed by you, but decided not to move ahead with it. We'll just have three types of projects. Hopefully, uh, you will find at least one of them very interesting. Uh, they are somewhat similar in the sense that um, all of them have to do with multi-class classification problems. All of them are going to be challenging because you will not be requested to only just train on a data set and learn a model, but rather you'll have to think a little bit, consult the literature and do something new. The focus is gonna be on uh, zero shot learning. So this was explained in the document I shared with all of you. Uh, it's on the website uh, and I, we announced it on Piazza. Um, the timeline is very tight. So basically we want you uh, to converge on a team and choose one of the three projects uh, and to the answer, uh, to answering the question on the chat, by the 11th, uh, please do that and report. We're gonna send you a Piazza message uh, with the spreadsheet where uh, we're, we're gonna collect all this information. Um, and then you have two weeks from today, I think, to uh, basically write an initial proposal. It's gonna be a one page document uh, that describes uh, what are you doing. Um, hopefully by that time you've had a chance to look at the data, play with it a little bit, read some relevant literature, 
and you have some plans, maybe you've already done something, we're gonna have a progress report uh, at the beginning of December, and then you will have two to three more weeks uh, to finish the project. Uh, and again, it's it's a. I think that these are really interesting projects, uh, challenging because it's not kind of your vanilla machine learning. It's a it's a really realistic problem or set of problems, something that people uh, face quite often today. Uh, and hopefully, you'll you'll figure out uh, how to make it interesting. Um, questions. No questions. Okay, so let's let's move on. Um, where are we? So we talked about SVM uh, last week, and eventually we converged to this optimization problem uh, that we called the hard SVM optimization problem, where this is the uh, definition of the problem. We want to minimize the size of W that separates all the data point with some margin, a fixed margin of one. So, so again, we know how to read this expression now. That basically means that the dot product Wx times the label is greater or equal to one. Uh, and that means that not only we separate the data, not only greater than zero here, but rather separated by margin. And among all those Ws that satisfy this for all the data that we have, we want to find the one with the smallest W. That's uh, SVM. Notice that this is a quadratic optimization problem uh, because of this W square here. Uh, we call these uh, uh, inequalities here, constraints, each data point in the training set S constitute a constraint because we want to be able to separate it. Uh, and this problem has a unique solution. So that's the SVM problem. Just to remind you why this makes sense, I'm reminding you an earlier slide that we look at where we said, okay, so this separating line here is the line WX plus B. And, and then we want all the blue points to be beyond the line WX plus B equal minus one, and all the red points here to be beyond the line WX plus B equal plus one. The extreme points, the closest to the hyperplane are those that reside exactly on the line uh, equal minus one and equal plus one. Uh, and that's that's what uh, SVM is going to guarantee us. So it's not only linear separation, but linear separation with a margin, uh, as we said. Uh, so this is another way of seeing exactly the same thing, right? So we are minimizing this size of W such that um, the dot product times yi is greater than uh, one. Here I'm just, the, the only difference is that I'm adding the b here. So as we know, we should be uh, comfortable with writing it with the b or folding the b into the w. Uh, and the important thing is that we know what is this margin, right? So we know that the distance between the closest points, those that are on the line plus one or minus one, have a distance of one over size of W from the separator. And our goal is to maximize this margin, right? So it all started where we realized that we want to maximize the margin because that's going to give us best generalization and maximize the margin once we realize that the margin is one over W is essentially minimize the size of W. And that's, that's really the base for SVM. Okay, so why do we call it SVM? It's really from the fact that this W or W star I denoted here is supported by uh, the examples that are exactly 
at a distance of one over size of W from the separating hyperplane. These are the support vector machines. And you can think about them as support vectors for two reasons. One is because they're the closest. Really, those are the examples that define the hyperplane. Those that are farther away, we actually don't care about them. Uh, you can change them uh, and nothing is going to happen to the hyperplane. The support vectors are those that really define it. And explicitly, uh, we can actually show it, and this is shown in this theorem. So this W star, the minimizer of the optimization problem, uh, can be represented in the following way. So I'm using the set I here to index all the examples all the examples for which the dot product is one, should have been Y here, I forgot to add it. And then there exists a coefficient alpha greater than zero such that W is really defined as the linear sum of these examples. So really in a, in a very explicit way, we don't care about the points that are farther away because W is defined only by those points that lie on the plus or minus one lines. And, and as we commented at the end when we, uh, uh, of last time, I mean, this representation should ring a bell. We've seen this when we talked about dual perceptron. Uh, we saw there that the linear hyperplane is defined by linear sum of examples. In the case of perceptron, the examples xi that define this w were all those examples on which we've made mistakes so far. So conceptually, it's really the same thing. These are also the examples that are closest to the line on which you are more likely uh, to have made mistake during the learning process. And we asked this question last time, I'm not gonna uh, spend time on it, but you should know that we're talking here about dual representation. Okay, so um, the duality is really important. We talked about it in the context of perceptron. The reason it's important is because it also allows us to use kernels. I'm gonna get to it a little bit later today, uh, very briefly. Uh, one note that is important just because some of you might be confused by it, we are actually doing some cheating here uh, because uh, really when we use the B here and when we do not use the B, the optimization problem is slightly different, right? So the, the formulation that we define is this, minimize, the size of W, W dot product W, such that all the examples are on the right side. But if we, and this is in the case where B is folded into W, if we do not fold it, really what we have to minimize is the dot product plus B square, uh, which is slightly different formulation, but no one is, no one cares about it and we will not care about it also. Uh, okay, some important issues that we want to address is computation. It used to be the training SVM was a very, very time consuming process because really we needed to solve a quadratic problem. Uh, it took time, uh, so SVM were invented in the uh, 90s. Uh, and it took quite a bit of time for people to realize that actually we don't need to solve quadratic problems, but rather we can use it, we can solve it using stochastic gradient descent algorithms. Um, so that's one important issue. Uh, we're going to give an explicit representation of this stochastic gradient descent algorithm in a few seconds. But before that, I want to generalize SVM a little bit. Um, and, and to think about, do I need to generalize it? We can ask, is it really optimal? Is it really the case that I always want to maximize the margin? Which is the principle that guides SVM. 
And, and the answer is, let's look at this case here. So I'm just plotting here a histogram of uh, a learning problem. In this case, it's a 17,000 dimensional problem, context answer spelling. And I'm showing here um, the histogram of positive, and positive and negative example and their distance from the hyperplane, which is here. And what you can see that there's no distance, right? So, so essentially, you have points that are as close to the line as you want. And in fact, you don't know whether the closest point here really are positive example or maybe negative and the same here. So, so really in realistic problem, it's never gonna be that you separate explicitly the problem as everything is far away from the line. Uh, you will have points that move to the other side. And the question then becomes, um, uh, do I really want to let my learning algorithm be dictated by the closest point to the hyperplane? Because maybe just a few of them, I mean, most of the points, the positive are around here, the negative are around there, but a few outliers or not outliers, but a few points move close to the line or even move to the other side. And these somewhat anomalies are gonna dictate what is the hyperplane? Maybe I don't want to do it. I want to allow for some flexibility. Um, so I want to relax this hard SVM formulations that really assumes linearly separable data and assumes that everything is going to be okay and the clouds of positive and negative examples are going to be farther away. So a natural relaxation of this to say, okay, I'm gonna allow some examples to violate these margin separability constraints. I wanna maximize the margin while minimizing the number of examples that violate this, these constraints. So that, that would be a natural relaxation, but it's very hard to do. As we talked about at the beginning of the semester, when you talk about minimizing the number of positive that moves to the negative side, or number of negative that moves to the positive side, this becomes a very hard optimization problem and we don't wanna do it. Instead, we wanna relax this problem and define a non -con and defines a convex optimization problem that is a little bit easier to solve. Uh, and typically we do this by defining a surrogate loss function that is convex and, convex and almost does that, not quite. And that's what we're gonna do here. So, so how are we gonna relax this constraint that we define here, right? This constraint that you already got used to hopefully that says all the examples, positive or negative are uh, farther away by one, by margin one from the separator. I'm gonna do it by adding a slack variable psi per example, so psi i, and now I'm gonna require not that y i times the dot product w x i is gonna be greater than one, but rather greater than one minus something, something that is positive, right? So that's a relaxation. Uh, and we in fact, so I've seen this before, this type of relaxation. So now, first of all, I'm gonna solve this relaxed problem. I'm gonna minimize the size of W plus some constant C times the sum of all this psi I over all the examples. And the constraints, as I said, are gonna be relaxed. So this YI times the dot product is gonna be greater than one minus psi I. Uh, now let's, let's think a little bit about what does that mean? So, so this is a constant and we're gonna tune this constant C. If I, if I put here a very large constant, what does that mean? It means that because I wanna minimize this sum, these psi i are gonna be very small. I want them to be small, right? What does it mean that I want them to be small? Let's assume that this is zero. Uh, that means that I'm very strict about the separability or if it's just a small positive, I'm still pretty strict about the separability. I don't want points to go into 
this thickness of, of the margin. Uh, so this happens when I insist that C is large. If I allow C to be small, that means that I don't care, this can be large, which means I'm allowing points to go into the margin, maybe even go into the other side, which means I'm allowing more training error. But hopefully, good generalization because overall I'm going to minimize this component, uh, this sum. So, so let's let's uh, look at this again. I'm I'm showing this picture where you can see that I have this point red point X here, uh, and when I'm allowing uh, that yi times the dot product is greater than one minus xi, I basically allow the points to move either inside the thick separator or all the way to the other side. That's that's what I want to solve now. Uh, now, let's rewrite it a little bit. So instead of saying that yi dot product wxi is greater than one minus xi, I'm going to isolate xi and say, oh, Okay, I'm going to rewrite this as I want that xi is going to be larger than one minus this. Uh, really, I didn't do anything, but uh, let's think a little bit about it. So what does that mean? Um, if everything is fine and this guy is greater or equal to one, this is going to be negative, right? So if I'm outside, I'm in this region of the red points or in this region of the blue points, that means that this product here is a number that is larger than one, which means this guy is negative. Psi i is, is zero, so it's going to be zero. It's always greater than this negative. However, when I'm relaxing it and allowing the points to move inside or to the other side, then this guy is going to be less than one, which means this is positive, or even this guy is going to be negative, which definitely makes this difference positive. So in the optimal case, the psi i is going to be the maximum between zero, when this guy is negative, and one minus this. And we've seen this before when we looked at these loss functions, specifically the blue one the hinge loss function, right? So that says that if you are to the right of one, right? If this W yi times the dot product is greater than one, my loss is zero here, right? So the max of this is zero. And as I move in, in this part, I'm inside the thick separator, right? So this is still positive, but it's less than one. So I'm here. And then when it starts to be negative, I'm moving all the way and climbing up this blue line here. So really what I'm optimizing now is, again, minimizing the size of W plus I'm replacing the xi i that I have here with this expression. So uh, the sum over all examples, max between zero and one minus y i dot product times the C, the C that is going to balance how seriously do I take this component. Uh, so everyone has seen this before, right? So uh, what is the real interpretation of what we are doing here, right? So again, we are balancing error with generalization. Uh, We've seen this already several times. Um, and I'm just saying the same thing that I said before again. Uh, th since the psi is, is positive, it's the max between zero and this difference. Um, and I'm writing it again as the error plus regularization terms, if you want, something that controls how well will I generalize in the future? Um, so we've seen this many, many times already. 
And we've seen that, you know, this empirical loss can be replaced by other loss functions, not necessarily the hinge loss we're talking about now. And regularization can also be replaced by other regularization function. But overall, this is the general form of a learning algorithms that we've seen before. We have, on one hand, minimal empirical loss. And on the other hand, we want to regularize to avoid overfitting or guarantee uh, regularization. So really what we've seen now is that SVM, just like the previous algorithm that we've seen, has the same kind of form as before. And let's, let's just look at it um, in some examples on kind of the balancing between empirical loss and regularization. I have the same training data in both cases here. In this case, I'm fitting this relatively narrow hyperplane, right? So this is my hyperplane, the dashed line, and it doesn't have a lot of thickness, but it separated the data completely. All the circles are above, all the triangles are below. And then in test data, I may suffer a little bit because you know some points are going to go inside or move to the other side, as you can see here. The other option is same data, but I'm going to allow uh, some points to deviate from the strict constraints. For example, this triangle went inside the thick separator and even moved to the other side but I'm allowing a thicker separator. And the hope that this thicker separator is gonna generalize better and everything in the future is gonna be uh, outside this thicker separator. So again, it's the balance between my empirical loss that is smaller in this case than it was in this case, but hopefully the balance is gonna be such that we're gonna do better in the future. Uh, I'm pointing here to a demo that I will not show now, but you can click on it. This is a demo of an SVM classifier from a group, a group in uh, Taiwan that really built the best uh, implementation of support vector machines. Uh, in fact, all the implementation of support vector machines that you're going to use follow their implementations. And you can also play with the demo there. You can choose some examples yourself and see what SVM is going to do uh, and so on. Okay, so, so just to summarize, where are we? We basically went back uh, through the SVM optimization problem to the same picture of underfitting and overfitting. We talk about the case of simple models on the left here where we have high bias and low variance or complex model. Right, so the x-axis here is the model complexity where we have high variance but low uh, bias. If you want, you can replace the bias with the word empirical error, which might be a little bit more intuitive, uh, but it's really the same thing. On the left side where we have simple models, we have high empirical errors, but hopefully good generalization. On the right side, we have expressive models we're gonna have low empirical error, but potentially worse generalization. And the truth is gonna be somewhere in the middle. Question so far. And of course, this, this reflects in the case of SVM on what C we wanna choose, right? So we wanna choose a large C if we care about low empirical error, and we wanna choose a small C if we don't care about high empirical error, but want to guarantee generalization. Question so far. Okay, no question. So, so let me try to summarize uh, where we are. We talked about SVMs. Really, we talked about what is called L1 loss SVM. This is the regularization terms, and this is how we measure the, the empirical loss, right? The sum over all examples, max between zero and one minus this yi dot product. We can change SVM a little bit and for example, square the empirical loss. It's a slightly different loss function. The form is exactly the same. 
we can also invent other uh, empirical uh, losses. So this is a, a log loss function. Uh, it's called logistic regression. In a couple of weeks, we'll also give a justification for why this loss makes sense sometimes. But at this point, what you care about is to see that, you know, all these loss functions, actually, if you care of them, look about the same, right? So the green one is the one we talked about all the time. This is really hinge loss, right? You've seen it this way. Now it's flipped symmetrically, uh, but it's really the same loss function. The blue one is when I square the empirical loss, it's the L2 loss function. And the red one is the logistic regression. And you can see that all of them behave about the same, uh, you know, as this Y times dot product uh, grows, the loss grows. Okay, so, so um, one thing that we haven't talked about a lot is optimization. How do we actually compute SVM? Now, in most cases, you will not care because you will just use a package, but it's still important to realize that there's many methods. Uh, as I said, it used to be very uh, computationally intensive to do this, no longer the case. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about these methods. I'm just gonna mention that there have been several generations of methods uh, that I'm listing here. Uh, one of them that is also popular is what is called dual coordinate descent and dual stochastic coordinate descent uh, that works in the dual rather than in the primal. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. I just want to show you, and in fact, you've seen it yesterday uh, in the quiz, that you actually know how to develop SGD for SVM. So. Once you've done it once, you know how to do SGD for any other uh, reasonable loss function. So again, our loss function was this, right? We want to minimize W square plus the sum over all examples, max zero, one minus Y dot product times a constant divided by M, which is the number of examples. This is really something that is there uh, for for uh, correctness, if you want, for no because we want the average error rather than the sum of the error. Um, but either way, you can take this function and compute the gradient. Um, and you've done this uh, in the quiz. I'm just going to write it down. It's easy to see that the gradient is going to have a W from this component minus C uh, times Yi Xi from this component. And this is the case where uh, one minus this is greater than zero. When uh, it's, when this component is less than zero, when we are on the good side uh, of there, we actually have not made error, then we don't, we just keep the gradient as W. It just comes from this part. The gradient here is gonna be zero. What is the algorithm that we get here? Here is the algorithm. We start, for example, with W equals zero. For every example, if we made a mistake, right? So Y times the dot product is less than one, we are gonna update according to this part of the rule, of the update rule, which means, W is going to become W minus the gradient, W minus gamma, which is my learning rate here, times W minus C, Y, I, X, I. And I'm rewriting it here this way. So it's, it's really W times one minus gamma plus gamma times uh, C, Y, I, X, I. Otherwise, W is going to be just uh, W minus gamma W that comes from this part. Now, again, it's a gradient descent algorithm, very, very similar to an algorithm that you've seen already. Right? So 
you've seen several SGD algorithms. Uh, and you can see that it's actually very, very similar to perceptron, with the exception that here we also update when we do not make a mistake. We actually multiply by W, multiple W by a small number. And this will allow us to actually uh, shrink the size of W eventually. So again, it's an algorithm that once we tell you, here is the loss function, we're gonna do SGD, you should be able to uh, develop the update tool yourself. Okay, so uh, to, to make sure that this algorithm converge, you have to modify it slightly and I'm not going to get to it. It's somewhere in the slide that I hid. It's a version that is called Pegasus, uh, but we, we won't care about it. We will just care about the fact that we understand SVM also as an SGD algorithm, just as we've done with Perceptron, slightly different update rule, but conceptually very, very similar. Question so far? Okay, so the last thing I wanna say about SVM is we already talked about the fact that SVM allows a dual representation. What does that mean? It means that I can take the data and map it to a higher dimensional space. So instead of working with X, I'm gonna work with some phi of X. And again, I have two options of how to do this. I can do this in the primal where it's the same algorithm. I'm minimizing the dot product of the W plus the empirical error, C times the sum of the Xi i's, such that all my examples satisfy my constraints. But in this time, the this case, the examples are phi of Xi. I blew up the feature space. Or I can use the kernel trick and that means that when I blow up the feature space from X to phi of X, I'm actually gonna use a kernel, which is the dot product of phi of X i with phi of X j. And that will give me the dual representation that I'm not writing explicitly here. I'm writing explicitly, but I'm not showing uh, why I get this matrix Q here. Uh, but again, it's somewhere in the slides. If you wanna understand exactly the development, it's basically some algebra, you can go down and look at it. The important thing for us is that you have a dual optimization problem for support vector machines. And the W that you're gonna get is exactly the W that I mentioned before, which is the linear sum of the support vectors. Uh, what is the impact of, of using kernels or not using kernels? Uh, as we already know, our expressivity is gonna be much, much better if we are using kernels because problems that we couldn't solve before because they were not linearly separable, now we can solve. Uh, I, I'm pointing here to two demos uh, where uh, again, they go to the uh, National Taiwan University a website and you can play both with kernels and with just SVM in the primal. Um, what I wanna show is just uh, one slide that will give you an idea of where things go. So these are two uh, implementations of SVM. One of them is called LibSVM, which is a general library for SVM that uses kernels. The results in this case are for the RBF kernels that we've seen earlier, or a linear version. So think about it as linear kernel, the version is called libLinear. <clears throat> and you can see results on several data sets. It really doesn't matter what they are. The important thing that you can see is that in general, on this side of the slide, the results are better because we are more expressive we can solve also problems that are non-linear. On the other hand, you can see that the time it takes to compute here 
is order of magnitude larger than the time it takes to learn here. And that's basically the trade-off that you're gonna get uh, when you deal with, uh, with support vector machines. Um, okay, questions? Everyone is too quiet today. Celebrated too much over the weekend, I guess, but that's okay, there's good reasons for that. So let's move on to my next chapter, which is boosting. So, um, okay, so, so where are we? Just kind of a quick summary. We've already covered a lot of algorithms. We covered some theory. We know something about mistake bounds. We know something about tech learning. We know something about learnability. Uh, and one way to think about what we're gonna talk about in the next half an hour or so is an algorithmic implication of the theory. But another way to think about it is a very practical algorithm that indeed was developed uh, as an answer to a theoretical question, but really uh, became a very, very important uh, learning algorithm. So, so what is boosting? So today boosting is really a general learning paradigm that allows us to put together a strong learner given a collection of many, many weak learners. You've seen this conceptual idea already in homework one, where you took a collection of weak learners, these were uh, small decision trees, and you put them together into a, co a better classifier. Now we're gonna do this um, with a very well-defined notion of what is a weak learner, a very well-defined notion of what is a strong learner, because we have tech learnability now, we know what is a learner, uh, and, and a more uh, precise algorithm for how to put weak learners together into a strong learner than what we had before. So, so this all is based on the original boosting algorithm that was proposed, uh, wow, 30 years ago now by Rob Shapiri in a, in a beautiful paper that is called The Strength of Weak Learnability. I think we put it on the website. This is one of the really nicest paper to read in machine learning. Um, and it has a lot of theoretical implication that I'm not gonna get into. If you want, you can read it and try to understand. Um, I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, the key practical contribution of boosting, uh, really as a way to compose a good learning for many weak learners, uh, and as a representative of an ensemble family of algorithms. Um, so among all the ensemble algorithms, boosting is the one that has the stronger guarantees. It's, it's the most, uh, it's the best uh, understood algorithm, if you want. Um, and, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run an example, describe the algorithm and briefly show some analysis. The reason I wanna show the analysis in this case is because one, it's very simple, but mostly because it's very insightful. It really gives an idea of what is error in learning, which is something uh, that most people don't really understand. You, you often think about error as something that has to do with counting, mistakes, but it's not. Error is something that has to do with the distribution, the underlying distribution that we are working with. And therefore, uh, I wanna go through the analysis. As you'll see, it will explain to us what error is. Um, okay, I see here uh, a late coming question on the trade-off uh, between marginal increase in accuracy and time. There's really no uh, principle uh, well understood trade-off. It's, it's really an experimental issue for the most part. Uh, 
Now, as we said at the end of the lecture on uh, dual perceptron, there are some guiding principles that have to do with the number of examples that you have and the dimensionality that you have. Um, but Below, be beyond that, really, it's 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 an experimental issue. There's no real, real theory that that um, we understand uh, for this trade-off. Okay, so let's let's start to talk about boosting, uh, and this is this is an old example, but still very relevant. Uh, one of the key examples where boosting was used at the beginning was this uh, service that AT&T provided that was called, how may I help you? Think Siri today, or think any of these calls that you wanna make to companies that uh, provide service and they expect you to interact with a machine, say something, and then they hope that some speech recognizer that stands below, uh, behind that uh, will understand what you wanna say and either solve your problem or at least directly you to the right people. So this was the, how may I help you service that came up in the mid nineties, was using boosting. And, and really the idea was, was the same as before. So I wanna be able to automatically categorize the type of call requested by the customer. So in that case, that what they, AT&T is a phone company. So they wanted to know, are you asking about collect calls, calling card calls, person-to-person -person calls and so on. And you would say something like this. Here's a few utterances that people might use. Uh, and the question is, can you develop a good machine learning classifier that will take your utterance? Yes, I'd like to place a collect call long distance, please. Uh, or anything else uh, and do what you want. So the observation they made is that it's actually very hard to do, very hard even today to take an utterance that is kind of three, four lines long and understand what it says to the extent that you can provide the right service. But it's easy to find some rule of thumbs that are often correct, right? So if you hear the word card, it's calling card uh, and, and so on. So, um, with this observation, uh, they thought that the boosting approach that was developed at the same time at AT&T in the uh, AT&T research would be an appropriate one. So what was the boosting approach? A very simple conceptually uh, approach where what you do is you start by selecting a small number of examples uh, and use them to divine to derive a rough rule of thumb, a simple classifier. Choose another set of examples, derive another rule of thumb. Do this many times, capital T times, and then combine them into a single hypothesis. Now, of course, the question is, how do I choose the small subset of examples? Are there principled ways to do it? Uh, how many times do I do it? And how do I combine the learned rules into a single hypothesis? Uh, so, um, so these are the questions that really boosting attempted to address. Um, and, and in fact, solve the problem by figuring out a provable correct method to doing all these steps. Now, so why, why is boosting so interesting? Really, Boosting is interesting because it started as one and was developed before these problems arise, just as an answer to a theoretical question. So what was the question? Well, we all know what is PEC algorithm today, or I'm gonna call it in the context of today, a strong PEC algorithm for any distribution, for any small positive constant delta and epsilon, given polynomially many random examples, a strong PEC algorithm is going to find a hypothesis that has small error, epsilon, with high probability, at least one minus delta. Now, can I relax this? 
can I have a weak pack algorithm? Everything is the same, but what I can guarantee with my algorithm is only that it's it find a hypothesis with some epsilon that is better than chance. So we're talking about binary classifiers here. So it's less than a half minus gamma, right? So the error is small than a half, bounded away from a half. So this gamma is a fixed number. So think about gamma as one over a hundred. So it's still bounded away from a half, but it's not as small as I want. So the question is, let's assume that I managed to find a weak pack algorithm. Does it guarantee to me that there exists also a strong pack algorithm? Can I take this weak one, one and boost it? So uh, in 88, uh, Valiant that started this, this learning theory work with Michael Kearns that you all know, faculty at Penn, uh, this was part of his PhD thesis then, uh, asked the question, Let's assume that you have a weak PEC algorithm. Does it guarantee also that there is a strong PEC algorithm? And they asked the question, they were not able to solve it at that time. In fact, they thought that it doesn't guarantee. And this is an important anecdote that, that I actually didn't spend enough time in earlier lessons to discuss, but really the result shows the importance of distribu the distribution-free assumption. The fact that we say here for any distribution, that's a crucial part of the PAC definition. Uh, they thought, I mean, their, their paper actually shows that all, if you have a PAC, a weak PAC learning algorithm that works only over the uniform distribution, then it does not guarantee that there is a strong PAC, strong PAC algorithm. So this could give rise to the uh, assumption that the answer is no. However, in fact, a year or two later, uh, in another good thesis by Rob Shapira, uh, he actually showed that the answer is yes. You can start with a weak learning algorithm and prove that there is a strong PEC learning algorithm. And his algorithm went conceptually this way. He basically uh, showed that you can use the weak learner three times on three modified distribution, very carefully modified distributions because of the for all distribution uh, assumption of PEC learning, uh, if you call it on very carefully chosen three modified distribution, you can slightly boost the accuracy. And if you repeat this recursively, you can bring the accuracy epsilon to be as small as you want. Um, so uh, this was the first boosting result that showed the strength of weak learnability. Uh, later on, uh, your friend in his thesis actually developed a different boosting algorithm that was called boost by majority. Uh, people at at and uh, then try to use it in practice, as I showed in the example before, one of them was how may I help, may I help you? Wasn't so successful. It turns out that the uh, boosting algorithm, uh, original boosting algorithm had some practical drawbacks, but a few years later, uh, Yoav Roin and Shapira together put together a new boosting algorithm that was called Adaboost for adaptive boosting that had really strong practical advantages over the previous boosting algorithms. Um, and, you know, as people say, the rest is history. This algorithm was very, very influential. Thousands of papers were written on it thousands, if not more, practical applications. Today, this is one of the most useful uh, learning algorithm um, that, that we know of. In fact, this history is very, very interesting uh, for you students uh, because of several reasons. First of all, um, you know, the fact that someone solved the problem here in 89 doesn't mean that you don't want to steal think about it. 
and try to solve it differently. And this is what you have pointed here. Uh, the fact that there are some solution to a problem does not mean that uh, you don't want to develop better solutions. And this is what they did here in 95. And, and one other interesting thing is that this paper that they published in 95 did not get into any major conference. They submitted it and it was rejected a few times because reviewers said, well, we already have boosting. We understand this. We don't need another boosting algorithm. It eventually got into kind of third rate conference uh, but had a huge, huge impact, much, much more than the previous versions of boosting. Uh, so patience is important. So you can take this if you want also as a lesson uh, in uh, patience or how to do research. Uh, but let's move on to boosting. So, so what is boosting? Uh, let, let's formulate the problem. We're given a set of M examples. M labeled examples. Our label is going to be plus or minus y. And here is how boosting is going to run. For capital T rounds, we're going to construct a distribution dt on our M examples. Uh, we're going to find a weak hypothesis, ht, that has small error, epsilon t, on the current distribution. This is how epsilon t is defined, right? It's the probability on our current distribution of this, the predicate ht is different than yt, that's the error. Uh, and we're gonna do this, as I said, t times, and then output the final hypothesis. Now, one, one thing I wanna highlight already now, we have a fixed set of examples. What does it mean to construct a distribution? over this. It means to weigh the examples differently. And once you weigh the example differently, you have a different notion of error because the error is the weighted sum of mistakes, right? As dictated by the distribution. If I hardly see some of them examples and see a lot of some other of the examples, the error that I'm gonna measure for the hypothesis is going to be different. Uh, okay, so so let's let's go into uh, these details a little bit. So how do I construct a distribution? Uh, so I'm going to start with a uniform distribution. I'm going to call it D1, and the weight of the i example is going to be just one over m uniform. And then I'm going to in each round, I'm gonna update it. How do I update it? So the t at round t plus one is gonna be a function of dt, the previous distribution, times some constant normalization factor, times e to the minus alpha t or e to the plus alpha t, depending on whether the previous hypothesis was correct, yi is equal to h of t, ht of xi, or I made a mistake. Notice that I can write these two lines together this way. Again, I have the previous hypothesis divided by a constant. This is just a normalization constant that is important, but we're gonna get to it later. Times e to the, notice that these two can be written this way. e to the alpha t, yi, h of xi, right? So. If I made a mistake, what does it mean that I made a mistake? It means that this product here is negative, right? So if I made a mistake, uh, it's negative. So what I have here is plus alpha t, it's this line. If I did not make a mistake, sorry, maybe I said it wrong. If I made a mistake, this is negative. If I did not make a mistake, I got it right, then this product is positive. So I have here e to the minus alpha t which is the first row here. Okay, so again, this notation, you should already feel uh, comfortable with. Now, what is this alpha t? Alpha t is defined as a function of epsilon. And uh, I want you to look at it and think a little bit about it and tell me 
Uh, what do you know about alpha T now? What do we know about epsilon T? Epsilon T is the, the error. We know that in boosting, the error is less than a half. If the error is less than a half, it means that this guy, uh, okay, B before I get to it, at the end, we're gonna uh, compute the final hypothesis that is gonna be the linear sum of the earlier hypothesis that we had, HT of X, weighted with the alpha T. Okay, so now we're talking about alpha T. So I wanna argue that alpha T is, is positive. Why is it positive? Because the error epsilon T is less than a half, which means that one minus epsilon T is greater than a half, which means this ratio is greater than one, right? And, and therefore this makes alpha T a positive number. What does it mean that it's positive? Let's look at what happens here in this update rule here. Because it's positive, you can e to the alpha t, again, this is alpha t. So e to the alpha t is the square root, comes from the half here, of one minus epsilon divided by epsilon. And again, we know that epsilon t is less than a half, and therefore, the numerator here is greater than the denominator. This number is greater than one, which basically means that if I got it right, I'm gonna demote the weight of the example. If I made a mistake, I'm gonna multiply it by a number that is greater than one. I'm gonna increase the weight of the example. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. I have a distribution over the examples. Those examples that I predicted corrected on, correct on, I'm gonna reduce their weight. I don't care about them so much now because I already got them right with my HT. Those that I made mistakes on, I'm gonna increase the weight on because I wanna focus on them now. I want my next hypothesis to focus on them uh, and eventually get them right. So examples that were predicted correctly are demoted, other were promoted. So that's one role of alpha here that you can see in this update rule. The second role of alpha is here in the weighted sum. And again, what does that mean? Uh, the larger the error, or the, let's let's the, the other direction, the smaller the error, the larger the weight I wanna to give to the hypothesis, right? So I wanna weigh here the important hypothesis, those that are more accurate, those that have smaller error, higher. And notice that if I have a small error here, what does that mean? It means that the ratio here is larger, alpha is larger, and therefore the good hypothesis are gonna be weighed higher. So that's, that's my algorithm. Again, just more details as we said before. Um, and ZT, I haven't talked about ZT, but ZT is just a normalization factor. It, it makes sure that what I have here is a distribution. What does it mean that what I have is a distribution? That if I sum over all the examples, it sums to one, right? I sum the weights of all the examples, it sums to one. So when I sum DT of I times E, to this thing over all eyes, I want to get one, which means ZT is exactly this sum. So that when I divide by ZT, I get one. So DT, ZT is simply the sum over all examples of DT of I times E to the alpha T, YI, HT. Questions on this algorithm? Uh, I have one question. So. If you're given HT, then that means that there actually is no change to any of the weight vector or anything like that here since you're given HT. So I learned HT. I'm, I didn't tell you how I got HT. 
HT could be a function of decision tree algorithm, could be a function of a perceptron algorithm, could be a function of SVM. I don't care now how I learned HT. The important thing is that I do this capital T times. Every round I learn HT and measure its error. And I want to optimize HT every time to give me a small error. And I know that I can do it. That's the assumption of the algorithm that I know that I'm going to get epsilon T that is less than a half. So I didn't tell you how I computed HT. I, I told you how to put together all the HTs into one final function. Does this answer the question? Uh, yeah, so so you have a, a, a already established hypothesis, regardless of how you got it, and you're just trying to figure out um, a final hypothesis out of it. I, I, what I have is a mechanism to produce hypothesis, because HT, H1 of X is different than H2 of X, different than H3 of X. Every round, I'm going to produce a different hypothesis. Uh, and then I'm going to put them together. Let, let's go to see an example. Um, OK, here is my example. So I have here uh, 10 examples, five pluses, five minuses. And I'm going to use the size of the plus or the minus as a way to indicate the weight of the example, the distribution over the example. Right? And again, the, the notion of error here is crucial in understanding boosting. Uh, so I'm starting with a uniform distribution, all the pluses and minuses have the same size. And I want to separate them. So first of all, my first, and I'm going to use as hypothesis here, uh, axis parallel separator. So either vertical lines or horizontal lines. Notice that my class of hypothesis is infinite. Right, because there are infinitely many vertical lines or horizontal lines. And every time I'm going to choose one, that's going to be my H, uh, and see what happens. OK, so the protocol hopefully will be clear. So this is my D1, and this is my first hypothesis. So the first hypothesis is this vertical line, and it leaves two positives on its left, correctly predicted, and all the rest are negative. So all the red negatives are predicted correctly only, but these three examples are incorrectly predicted. So what is my epsilon here? My epsilon is 0.3, because each example weighs 0.1. I have 10 examples. Each example weighs 0.1, so epsilon is 0.3. If you use the formula, the alpha formula, you will see that alpha in this case is 0.42. What do I do now? Now I generate an X distribution. Now notice that I made mistakes on these three examples. So I'm gonna change the distribution so that these three examples are heavier. They became bigger pluses, okay? And because it's a distribution, so the weight have to sum to one, all the other seven examples become smaller. So these two pluses and these five minuses become smaller. This is my D2. Now I'm gonna learn another classifier. Again, either a vertical line somewhere or a horizontal line somewhere. This is now my H2. H2 is a vertical line here. Uh, and it leaves negative examples to its right, positive examples to its left, and let's see what happens. So these two negative examples are predicted correctly. All the five positive examples are predicted correctly, but these three negative examples are predicted incorrectly. So I have again, three errors. What is my epsilon two? My epsilon, epsilon 2 is only 0.21. Why? Before I had three errors and my epsilon 1 was 0.3. But now all the examples, 
these examples way less because I downgraded their weight in the previous round. So now the weight of these three examples is just 0.21. So you see my error is smaller despite the fact that the number of mistakes I made is the same. Uh, so it's only 0.21. And if you do the computation, you'll see that alpha two now is 0.65, larger than before, right? So I had 0 0.3, 0 0.42. I have smaller epsilon and therefore larger alpha. Again, go to the formula and you'll see that alpha goes up as epsilon goes down. Now I have these examples. What do I see now? Again, I take these three examples on which I made a mistake, these three negatives, and I increase their weight. They are bigger minuses now. All the others, I decrease their weight because I got them right. So you can see that these pluses are very small now. These minuses are very small now because I always got them right, first round and second round. These are somewhere in the middle because at the beginning I got them wrong, but now I got them right. So these are the ways that I have now. Uh, again, I'm gonna try to learn a classifier. In this case, I learn a horizontal line and above the line is positive. So I got these three examples right. I got all the negative below the line right, but I, I got this negative wrong and these two positive I got wrong. Again, three mistakes, but now these are on examples I downweighted already before. So my epsilon is 0.14, even though it's three mistakes. And my alpha, as you expect, is going to be even larger because my epsilon is smaller. So I basically ran all this algorithm. I ran it only three times. My capital T is three. Uh, and that's what I get. Now I have my H final, which is the sign of a linear sum of these three hypotheses. 0.42 was my first alpha. 0.65 is my, my second alpha, 0.92 is my third alpha. So the linear combination of this gives me this linear hypothesis. And you can see that all the blue things are correct. All the red, pink things are correct. This new hypothesis makes no mistakes. It's perfect. Question on the algorithm. Um, <clears throat> how do you get from H1 to H3. So again, I don't tell you how I got the H's. The important thing is just how to put them together. So I have a magic box that looks at the data and learns the hypothesis. It could be a perceptron, it could be an SVM, choose your favorite algorithm. So the important thing is uh, how do I determine the distribution, right? So again, I started with this uniform distribution and my magic box of decided that this is gonna be my H1, this vertical line. And then I downweighted it because my epsilon was 0.3, my alpha was 0.42. And now I'm running my learning algorithm on this. My learning algorithm now gives me this vertical line. This is my H2. Again, I'm computing the new hypothesis. The important thing is that even though I made three mistakes, they they worth less now. It's only, my error is really 0.21. And then I'm running my magic box on this new data set, this one represented here, and I'm getting this H3. And this is the error that it has. So I didn't tell you how the learning for H has worked. It was just find the best, vertical or horizontal line that separates the data. 
I didn't show the details of this magic box. I just showed what happens when I get this H3 or H2 or H1 and how do I go about in order to put together my final hypothesis. Does this answer uh, the question? Got it. Yes. Thanks. Okay, so, so we have an algorithm now. Um, here is one cool and important note about the final hypothesis. In boosting, uh, it's quite possible that as you go, you generate H1, you generate H2, H3, each one of them makes mistakes, but their combination already makes no mistakes on the training data. Just like we see here, after three, I make no mistakes on the training data. But you can actually still learn weak hypotheses uh, and boosting is still gonna improve. The final hypothesis still is gonna improve. Okay, so here is the theorem that we're not gonna to prove today, but I wanna state it at least because I want you to start thinking about it. This is what the theorem says. You're gonna run other boost. Your epsilon t is gonna be a half minus something positive, which means it's better than chance. Then your training error is gonna be bounded by uh, the product of this expression here, which is two times the square root of epsilon t, one minus epsilon t. Um, so a function of the error in all the rounds, previous round indexed by t. There is a little bit of algebra here, which I'm not gonna do now. It's in the slides and I'll get to it next time. But the important thing is that this turns out to be e to the minus two times the sum of all the gamma t's. And the gamma t's, remember, are how much far am I from, from chance? Now, I'm gonna assume that since I'm running a finite number of rounds, t, there exists therefore a gamma that is smaller than all the gamma t's. Uh, positive and smaller than all the gamma t's. That, that should be clear. I'm taking basically the smallest gamma t's over all the t's. And then the trainer error of boosting is less than e to the minus two gamma square times t. Capital T is the number of rounds. That's the, uh, that's the uh, theorem about uh, other boost. And, and I wanna leave you with these two questions. And I want to think about it because we're going to start next time with this. Uh, maybe let's, let's start with the second question. I want you to think about what does that mean? You already know how to read math. So think about what does it mean that I promise you that my training error of the final hypothesis is going to be bounded by e to the minus two gamma square times t. That's question two. Question one is, why is it that I'm happy by bounding the training error? Really, we don't care about training error, right? We care eventually on how we're gonna do in the future. Why is it that I'm still happy about bounding the training error? Rethink what we said in the previous few lectures about PEC learning theory, generalization theory, and so on, and explain to me and to yourself, why is this an okay thing to hope for? So this is where we're gonna start next time. We're gonna finish boosting um, and start talking, talk a little bit about multi-class classification, but mostly start talking about uh, neural networks. Questions before we end. No question. So please go over uh, this other boost algorithm. Feel free to pick ahead to the next few slides uh, so that you'll be able to answer these two questions that, uh, that I'm asking here. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye.